justice for all. I can't hear back here.
cemented. We had asked that. And it's cemented, but when they cemented it, I think we lost about a foot of depth. So now, it, it's, it just cannot hold the level of water that goes through there. My tenant is displaced. He's living in a hotel. And I don't know what else really we can do. I think we need your help. And I hope we can get your help in a, in a collaborative way to fix it. And I think I'm probably out of time, but the main point is that I believe that it's, and we're checking, but I believe that uh, you won't, that it's an easy one. You don't ask questions, right? That's it. And thank you. Thank you so very much. Next we have Pam Broder, followed by Andrew B. Hi, my name is Pam Bronner. I own a property in between two streets, Haven and I'm not burning. Anyway, there is a culvert that was put in by the city of Lemon Grove. Um, there is a problem that it is flooding or over spilling into several properties. Um, it causes problems not only in our property, but however, it causes problems in about six to ten homes. That is many constituents. This would be a huge benefit not only to my property, but also to many, many other homes that it has caused problems, flooding um, and other issues. So thank you for hearing my cry. I really appreciate all of the work that you have done for our community, our city, and I appreciate it. So thank you for listening to me. Thank you so very much. Next we have Andrew B, followed by Debbie Tellis. City Council. Uh, my name is my name is Andrew Bean. Um, I'm actually Craig's neighbor. We're up two four five four, Edding Drive. Um, we're stopping by and we're came to just address you guys about a sinkhole that we have. I just wanted to speak from my our perspective. Um, the sinkhole is right on our property line, so it's it's right on our fence line. Um, it presented itself on January 22nd when we had the storm. The, the, the rain event. Um, we contacted the city on that day to notify them of the sinkhole. Um, someone came by and took photos and they said they would speak to the city manager about it or to their, his manager, somebody from um, Public Works. Um, and then I didn't hear anything back after that. Um, it's been about a month. This has become a dangerous situation. Our driveway is cracking. Our fence has fallen in like uh, Craig said it's about seven feet deep. Um, we have six kids that live with us. We have five of our own and our nephew. Um, a lot of young kids and they can't even traverse the driveway or play in the backyard. Um, I work in construction, so I already know this is like, a, this is a dangerous hazard. I was hoping the city would um, do a few things um, for the safety of our family, that they would come by, that they would assess and investigate the cause of the sinkhole that they would place tent fencing around the sinkhole until they can fix it and they would develop an action plan to fix the sinkhole before it gets worse. Again, um, it's it, we're pretty certain that this is caused by a failed storm drain that the city owns. And I'm hoping that you guys will have uh, take this into consideration, have the empathy and do the right thing. Thank you so very much. Uh, next we have Debbie Tellis, followed by Jean Carpenter. My name is Debbie Thais. I live at 7440 Central Avenue. I have a channel that runs along my property. It's not an easement or anything. You guys have the street literally paved to pour right into my property along with a pipe that's 21 inches. I still have water on my property from the last big storm because it does not drain out. I really would like somebody to come out and look at it. I have been talking to you guys on a regular basis from 2017, so this isn't a one time. It totally flooded out like it did during this big storm five times last year. I have repeatedly been to your, I would like somebody to come out and talk to me and I can show them what's going on. And when you pave the streets this next time, I don't want the street paved. 
like a big Y that goes straight onto my property. You guys need to find somebody else to take that water. I cannot take it anymore. It's starting to cave in and fall apart. So now I'm losing more property that just floats in there. I've got a neighbor that puts out sandbags in the middle of the street. So now I've got five sandbags with the sand in this thing. The only way to clean it out is to sit on the side with a hand shovel and scoop it out. You can't get machinery in there and you can't stand up in it to clean it out. The only one that's been there is the maintenance and he has seen the problem. And for you guys to say you're not responsible, but it took over seven years for anybody to physically say that, but still haven't seen it in writing. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Next, we have Jean Carpenter, followed by Brenda Hammond. Thank you, Mayor, City Council. I'm really sorry to hear. I'm very sorry to hear about Council Member Gastil. Um, I used to work in uh, Lemon Grove uh, for the Postal Service here locally, uh, put in a lot of sweat uh, for about five years. Um, however, I've been a resident of La Mesa uh, for about 30 years. Um, I'm here tonight um, to speak up and out for the resolution, proposed resolution that's pending uh, for the Lemon Grove City Council to um, stand up and stand out for the men, women, and children in Palestine. Uh, my city council in La Mesa, uh, collectively, I don't think they have the courage, the empathy, or the love in them to do such a thing. So I'm here in Lemming Grove, and I hope you'll all give a lot of thought to that and what that would mean to so many in the area and our community. Thank you very much for your consideration. Next, we have Brenda Hammond, followed by Matt Kraszynski. Hello. So, um, as you know, I've been taking videos and um, still shots of the storm drains and the runoff. I've been doing that for the past two weeks. Um, I hear there's an environmental group that says, oh, you can't take those out of there. You have to replant them. Give me a break. If those things are mature. You take those things out and replant them, they're gonna die anyway. Get a bulldozer and get that stuff out of there. Also, um, they should have been maintained in the first place. They really need to be. You can't just go out there and get a bunch of grants and take it all out now. I mean, you can, but you know, they need to be maintained. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Matt Kaczynski, followed by Chris Williams. Um, I think there's a mistake. I put mine down for agenda item number two to speak about. Oh, what does? No problem. Thank you. Um, we have Chris Williams, follow, followed by Medgad Ashton. Good evening, City Council, Madam Mayor. Uh, just wanted to reiterate the importance of actually agendizing the storm drains. As you know, the municipal code says you guys cannot take action unless it is agendized. So the workshop is great, but these people deserve to have their voices heard and put on the record. I toured some of the properties today and they are beyond dangerous. There are families and young ones who cannot go out and play in their own yards that they have to pay a mortgage for. And it is unacceptable that they are being told that they have to carry the burden of their neighbors and the city's storm drains. Please do your job, have some empathy, respond to these people's emails, show up at their homes, at their elected representatives, and show them you care. It is a dangerous, situation that some of these people are living in and they are facing uh, and they are just asking for your help and your responsibility and your obligations that you swore to take care of them. If you guys are not protecting the people, what are you doing? Please, again, listen to these people 
have empathy for these people and agendize what is needed to be agendized. So that way you guys can come up with a plan, an action, not just talk that will happen in a workshop. As some of these people have stated, they have for years told you about their situation with storm drains. By the way, I also stand with Palestine. Thank you so very much. Next we have Meshdan Afshan, followed by Sarah Farid. Good evening, council members. Good evening, Mayor Vasquez, fellow council Could you speak up, please, yes. speak up. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor Vasquez, council members, and fellow uh, community members. My name is Mejgan Afsham, and I am the executive director of Borderlands for Equity, a pro bono civil rights nonprofit based here in East County that serves the whole of San Diego County. We are praying for Council Member George Gastel's full recovery, hopefully, and also praying for the families of those who are suffering from these floods, as well as recent storms that we've had. Uh, we have recently experienced a huge onslaught of discrimination against those people that are part of our Muslim, Arab, Middle Eastern, Jewish, and many other groups regarding what's happening in Palestine and Gaza. We have come to you as an organization and many other community groups today to ask for your support on a re resolution introducing a ceasefire, a request for ceasefire for our community members that are struggling right now. A ceasefire hasn't been passed by any level of our local politics in San Diego County. And because of the needs of each community, whether it be town, region, uh, uh, Southern California as a whole that have been affected by these floods, the funding that continues to go to these wars, wars in other countries can be used and should be used for places exactly like Lemon Grove and La Mesa, Spring Valley, Santee, and uh, our, South, uh, our uh, South Bay regions that have been affected. It's really important right now to understand also that Lemon Grove is one of the leaders of civil rights in our history in San Diego County. This is one of the places where uh, desegregation happened, which even though that was a federal issue, we continue to see the, the changes that have been made as a result of the leadership of this city council and this specific city. We ask that you please urge, we urge that you please pass this resolution and we would love your guidance on how we can be able to put it on the agenda and have it up for vote on uh, this coming uh, next meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. Next we have Sarah Farik, followed by Sammy Altralova. Good evening, Mayor Vasquez and city council members. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that council member Gastil um, is suffering through that and I wish him speedy recovery. Uh, my name is Sarah Farouk. I am a member of the Borderlands for Equity Advisory Board and an organizer with the San Diego for Palestine Coalition. I'm speaking here today to urge the city council to introduce and support a ceasefire resolution. Passing this resolution will allow Lemon Grove to join the over 40 cities across the country uh, who are calling for a ceasefire and will show the rest of San Diego County that Lemon Grove cares about the human rights of people in the US and in Palestine, Gaza. This is extremely critical at a time where 1.8 million Palestinians in Gaza are forcibly trapped in Rafah a city that's almost the same size as San Marcos. Why is passing a resolution so critical? Passing this resolution is not only a way for you all and for us to join the international call for a ceasefire, but it's also important in creating a domino effect to push our federal elected officials to do what is needed and what is right for the moment. A ceasefire means the stopping of this violence and murder of innocent human life. It also means that you all, elected city council members and mayor, are leaders in the San Diego region who care about dignity and human life. This issue may seem like a faraway issue abroad, but it's something much closer to home. Many community members care about this. This issue crosses racial, ethnic, and religious lines. A recent national poll showed that 61% of likely voters are in favor of a ceasefire. This issue unites all of our communities, and we want the Lemon Grove City Council to represent that and to represent your constituents. So again, I urge you all to introduce and pass the ceasefire resolution. This is a very critical and timely matter, and I hope that you will listen to all of your community members. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Sammy Otolova, followed by Oren Robinson. Uh, 
Hello, Mayor Vasquez, council members. My name is Dr. Sammy Ortoleva. I'm a resident of San Diego, and I'm a queer Palestinian American. Uh, the single greatest honor of my life is having been raised by strong Palestinian women, foremost among them my mother, who was born a year after the shattering of our society began during the Nakba in 1948. My family's ancestral village, El Mzeira, was a small farming community. Our great crime was being of and living off the land that others coveted for themselves alone. For this, our village was attacked with overwhelming force. My grandfather's blood was spilled, and the entire village was razed to the ground. It is a historical accident that I am here in front of you today. My grandparents escaped genocidal Zionist forces by fleeing to the West Bank, but they could have just as easily fled to Gaza. I am no more deserving of life than the Palestinians in Gaza being starved and massacred as we speak. And they are no less deserving of life than me. I beg you to publicly call for a permanent and immediate ceasefire Every life lost tomorrow is a life that could have been saved by having a ceasefire today. Lemon Grove can make a difference by adding its voice to the growing chorus of cities and communities across the country calling publicly for a ceasefire to pressure our federal government to do the same. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Next we have Oren Robinson followed by Layla. Good evening, Mayor Vasquez and Lemon Grove. My name is Oren. Oren is a Hebrew name for a tree um, that is indigenous to the Mediterranean. And I am not a, a Lemon Grove resident. I live in San Diego, um, but I'm here representing over 100 Lemon Grove residents as a member of Jewish Voice for Peace San Diego, uh, which is one of dozens of chapters, entirely volunteer, entirely grassroots. We've existed here since 2013, and we are the world's largest anti-Zionist Jewish organization, which means that we stand against the apartheid and the border walls and the indiscriminate killings and the vigilante violence and the 75 years of military occupation of Palestine. Here in Lemon Grove and around San Diego County, there have been dozens of organizations and conversations spanning generations, bringing together Jewish, Palestinian, and other people of faith and conscience who stand against what has been happening and what our government has been funding. And so I implore you, if you have not already, to go sometime when you have a little bit of time to YouTube and search for a film that was made by San Diego residents called 1948, Creation and Catastrophe, so that you can begin to understand the sheer cruelty and clear impunity of what is happening today. So we have over 6,000 supporters in San Diego County, over 100 of them at least live here in Lemon Grove, and we join the chorus of both Republican, Democrat, and independent people who the majority of Americans today support immediate ceasefire. And I implore you all as Lemon Grove to be leaders in human rights by supporting a ceasefire as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much. We're going to take a quick pause uh, because I think that our system may be working now. Yes. And our um, our system is now working. Testing, testing.
Testing, testing. Thank you so much. I want to thank staff for working uh, expeditiously to try and get our mic up and running uh, for the city council meeting. And so now we will proceed um, with our public comment portion of the meeting and we'll proceed with Layla followed by Sophia. Good evening, Mayor and council members. My name is Layla. I'm currently a junior at UC San Diego. Um, as a Palestinian Muslim student, I come here before you to ask to create a change that affects me and my family overseas. Not only is this an issue overseas, but an issue that affects us locally. So many Palestinians and Muslims here have families that are impacted. The Swana Muslim community in UC San Diego have felt nothing but a hostile environment from the Pearson administration. The administration has met with Israeli groups on campus and has yet to meet with the Palestinian and Muslim communities on campus, clearly displaying a double standard. Introducing and passing this resolution could be the beginning of combating the immense amounts of Islamophobia along with the Swana hate in our community. Change can start here by calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire. Thank you for your time. Thank you so very much. Next we have Sophia, followed by Julie. Good evening, Mayor Vasquez and council members. My name is Sophia, and I am a part of Students for Justice in Palestine at UC San Diego. And I come here before you today because I am a student, and I hope to one day become a city council member, or a representative, or some kind of politician. However, lately, School has been an incredibly hostile environment. School used to be one of my favorite things. It is something that is important to the Palestinian experience is education. Because education is the one thing that no one can take away from us. But lately, I have had fears, along with many other Palestinians and Muslim students on campus, of showing up to school. Because I've been receiving multiple death threats for the activism that I've been doing. I have, it has been incredibly unsafe for me to show up to campus simply for my ethnicity and for my background. But I ask you guys to please take a firm stance and to show that you support us, to support Arab and Muslim and Palestinian students as well. I am a first generation student. The path has not been easy. However, I have been able to sustain and continue carrying forward as I hope create long-lasting change. You are able to create change here in our community and something that affects everyone worldwide. I ask you all to please introduce this resolution and add it to the agenda and pass it because it begins with us. Protect us students and please allow me to one day become a politician or a city council member or wherever this path may take me. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Next, we have Julie, followed by Yasmin Obed. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. My name is Julie, and I'm a student at UCSD. I could be spending most of my days studying for my rigorous exams or spending time with my family. Rather, I'm working multiple jobs to make ends meet. It is very upsetting to know that my taxes are being sent overseas rather than back here to make sure my health care is affordable, but I digress. As a Muslim student on campus, my peers and I have been subjected to Islamophobic comments on and off. I'm here today to ask the city council to support a ceasefire that will not only end the war happening in Gaza, but end the rising violence my Muslim peers and I are being subjected to on a daily. <coughs> a growing number of cities around the country have called for a ceasefire and a growing number of labor unions have called for a ceasefire. I believe the city council can follow in these footsteps and stand for peace by introducing resolution to call for a ceasefire today and passing it. This is the first step towards a lasting peace. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Yasmin Obed, followed by Cheryl Robinson. Good 
Hello. All right. Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and staff. Thank you so much for having us here today. I'm praying for Council Member Gastel, Gastel's quick and recovery. My name is Yasmina Abid, and I'm a Muslim Palestinian American community organizer and advocate. I grew up in Palestine and lived there for 16 years in the West Bank. I have my sister and her family of six living there right now, uncles and aunts, best friends from high school and, and middle school, as well as a lot of extended family. In the past four months, we witnessed Israeli military wipe out complete Palestinian villages, complete um, hospitals, infrastructure, um, schools, churches, mosques. We've seen them wipe out families. The entire family is destroyed and gone. We've seen them kidnap over 5,000 Palestinians across Palestine and the West Bank and Gaza. And we've seen them murder over 30,000 people, Palestinian people, half of them at least children. My family in Palestine has been making sure that they're home before sunset in order to avoid Israeli, Israeli settler violence as well as um, uh, checkpoints and raids. And again, they live in the West Bank, not Gaza. What is happening is not in, only impacting my family thousands of miles away. As you heard from others, it's impacting Palestinian constituents here in Lemon Grove and across the county of San Diego. Many of us are facing anti-Palestinian rhetoric and Islamophobia on the daily. Many of us are being criminalized in our jobs Many of us are being criminalized on our college campuses and in our K through 12 schools. A lot of children here in Lemon Grove and across the county have been witnessing and victims of anti-Palestinian rhetoric and Islamophobia by their teachers and administration. It, it has been absolutely horrific. According to the US Campaign for Palestinian Rights, Approximately $333,000 from Lemon Grove taxpayer money is going to fund the Israeli military. This is not something the city council controls, but this is something our government is doing on our behalf. This is something that Lemon Grove residents deserve this money should be invested in Lemon Grove. It should be thank invested you, your time in has our expired. community. Please introduce the ceasefire resolution. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, next we have Cheryl Robinson followed by followed by Yusuf Miller. Good evening, Mayor Vasquez and Council. My prayers are with me, uh, uh, Council Member Gasco. Um, my name is Cheryl Robertson. I do serve on the Lemon Grove School Board as a trustee. It's important that I let you know I am here today in my personal capacity as a resident of Lemon Grove. And tonight I am here in support of Meshvan Afshan, Borderlands for Equity, Jewish Voices for Peace, and to ask that you hear their words and act on them. It might be easy for naysayers to look at the issue and think that this has nothing to do with them, for us as a community, but I would disagree. As a community, there's still much that we are fighting for and it will undoubtedly take time for us to recover from the recent flooding. I am hopeful that the federal disaster declared yesterday will bring the much needed FEMA funding to our community. But while we deal with the fallout of the January 22nd disaster, the rest of the world continues to turn and this council is built of five people who were elected on grassroots campaigns. You do not answer to big funders who are funneling hundreds of thousands of dollars into campaigns. You have the power to pressure politicians higher up the ballot who are putting donors before their constituents. For those in this room who, who do not feel this resolution matters to this community, I say you are look, not looking at the whole picture. 
and you have the privilege of looking away or changing the channel when this conflict flashes across your TV. If you are unaware, the death toll in, Palestinian, in Palestine has now surpassed 29,000. As someone else said, probably more recent numbers, uh, but more than 20, 12,000 are innocent children. Additionally, more than 25,000 children have lost one or both parents. I think about my children. Israeli Defense Forces have raped women, gunned down innocent Palestinian refugees fleeing for their lives while waving white cloth in the air, and both are war crimes. Illegal Israeli settlements plague the West Bank where Palestinians are being forcibly removed from their homes and thousands are being held in detention without charges or due process. The Israeli government takes taxes and controls funding for Palestinian communities. They control the water and the segregated roads. What Hamas did on October 7th is egregious and unacceptable, but Israeli defense forces and the Israeli government have long been committing apartheid and now continue to carry out their genocide and our federal government is funding it. Israel continues to threaten Rafah. Egypt is constructing a wall and previous peace treaties are, con coming, is up. are coming dangerously close to being nullified. Thank you so very we much. We are on the brink of Next war we have and we are a military Miller. community. If you Thank can you. approach the podium. Thank you so very much. Yusuf Miller. The lights would be helpful too. The lights are not working right now. Mayor, City Council, my name is Yusef Miller, and I'm here to support the resolution for ceasefire and humanitarian aid to Gaza. As we see in the black community has standing up for Palestine. We see Martin Luther King speak about the right for Israel to exist, but at the same time, he speaks against militarization. His three evils that he spoke about was racism, poverty, and militarization. These evils play all of us. And we cannot sit here and say, oh, if I was with Martin Luther King, I would march with Martin Luther King and say what Martin Luther King says. I can tell you 100% you will do now what you would have done at that time. You cannot say that when 40,000 children have been lost, elderly, and families destroyed, that I would say something, I would do something in Africa, in South Africa, in, in Asia, in Europe, I would say something, you cannot. You would do exactly what you do now. So we can't reflect on ourselves and put ourselves at a higher moral standard without measuring that standard by what we do and say about Palestine. This is a global crisis, a crisis that affects all of us. When we see in our schools that our beloved Israeli children are being comforted in our K-12, and they have to call people like us to come and support the Palestinian students, the Muslim students, for being bullied throughout K-12. No official uh, support goes out throughout the county for these children because they are the enemy while others are not. This is a crisis on both sides. There are no winners on either side. We have to make sure that we stand up and say the right thing, something that we can be proud of. And as yet, there are only very few people and very few counties, very few cities who have done this. We want to be among the righteous, but we can't sit back silent and then say 10 years later, 20 years later, that I would have stood for another crisis like this when they look back and see what you've done for Palestine. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And that was our last speaker slip for public comment. I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for being patient with us tonight as we work through issues with the mic. Uh, I know that your time is very precious and we appreciate all of the comments that were shared. But also, wow, um, we do have the mics now. Again, thank you so much. Um, we are not functioning 100%. So as we move through the agenda tonight, um, the lights are not working on the podium. There's usually a red, yellow, and green light. Right now, our city clerk um, is letting you know when your three, minute, your three minutes have ended. So uh, please continue to be patient with us. Uh, we're still trying to troubleshoot the complete system. <laughs> and what I'll do now is, regarding the public comment portion, 
of this meeting. I'll turn it over to uh, staff to see if they have any comments regarding what was shared tonight. Thank you. Madam Mayor City Council, only one item that I would like to share was in a due to the manager report that Ms. Robinson um, actually answered by saying that President Biden did declare a major disaster for San Diego County for federal assistance. The FEMA will be out here. It's for public assistance only, only which means it's for the residents that have had sustained damage. Um, the declaration does not include public agencies such as us um, to get reimbursed for our response only for um, residents. The county is working with FEMA to set up sites, disaster sites. Um, I haven't heard as of five o'clock um, this evening where those disaster sites will be, but as soon as we know, you will know, we will make sure it goes out on our social media sites um, and our website so everybody that wants to have access to FEMA dollars, they can have access to FEMA dollars. And Madam Mayor, that is all that I have. Uh, thank you so very much. And as we are uh, done with our public comment <coughs> of the meeting, um, so before um, we have council members make comments, I just want to check in with our city attorney to make sure that we are uh, moving forward um, as noted per law as um, as we are not permitted to comment on public comment. Um, I, any items for discussion have to be agendized um, and so anything that's, that is not on the agenda um, that's why we have public comments so you can make comments and then um, those items may be agendized for future meetings. Um, any any comments in response to public comment would have to be very brief and, and not discussion oriented or argumentative. Uh, thank you so very much for providing that clarity on the record. And so, um, per the instructions that I have here, we are not allowed to make comments regarding uh, public comment. Um, and uh, staff has been taking notes and I implore you, if you have questions or comments, to follow up with staff. So um, what I'm going to do is move forward to uh, the consent calendar. So, um, Madam Mayor, if I may respond uh, to Council Member LeBaron. Uh, yes, um, as soon as I got wind that the audio system was not working, and before the council meeting started, um, I did record the meeting on my iPad, and I can, I can go ahead and upload this to the city's website um, by tomorrow morning, no later than tomorrow morning. Perfect, thank you, Joel. Is that going to be included in the audio clips where people can read? hear the rest of the meeting, is that gonna be in there as well? So at this time, um, I will need to um, figure out the technologies behind it because 
um, I might have to post this as two audio recordings, or okay. I can work with um, Greg, our communication specialist, so that way he can merge the two audio recordings, the one that's recorded on my iPad here tonight, and then also on the uh, city's uh, sound system here. Perfect, so long as what they said, you captured it in totality on your iPad? Yes, that audio is correct. recorded. That is correct. And you're saying that you, you're going to put it together on our city website, yes. so that if any of these folks wanna tell somebody, hey, go listen to what we said that day, it's on the record, I said this, we can't, it's there. There's no refuting it. What they said is there on the record, yeah? That's correct. So Perfect. then I will work with Greg to see if he could merge the two audio clips. Perfect. Um, so that way it's just one recording of tonight's council meeting. Perfect, okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you, and I believe Jennifer Mendoza, Council Member Mendoza had a question. Oh, it's Council Member Allison Snow who had a question. So I would just like to, after hearing the comment uh, from all the speakers, put on the agenda uh, the opportunity to review this resolution for consideration. I would also like to ask something just as she just did. I would also, after hearing the public comment, I would also like to put on the agenda that we agendize talking about um, these folks case, those folks case, and who else spoke? Those other people with broken sperm brain issues. That they all, and Miss Debbie's case, I would like to ask that everybody who came forward today talking about failed infrastructure, that their cases be put on the agenda so that we can discuss this. So um, what I hear are two separate things. One yes, is uh, to put on the agenda um, infrastructure. Um, that is correct. And the concerns of city residents. And then mm -hmm. um, the other request is to put on the agenda um, the resolution. And so I'll link to my city attorney to provide clarity regarding those two uh, requests. Oh, I ask that we take those in turn, that you make a motion that it be agendized. You need a second. Um, you only need two people to put something on the agenda per our council rules. So if you have a support from one of your other council members, it, it will be agendized. Um, and then um, in terms of timing or schedule, um, I, I, don't con I don't control those rules. It depends on availability on the, on the agenda. So if you can, you obviously, um, I would take one at a time. So the first motion that's in front of us is from uh, Council Member Snow. If she has support from one other council member, it really doesn't need to be a motion. It just needs to be supported by one other council member. The same with Council Member LeBaron. So I, I would start with Council Member Snow. And, and I would ask that you be clear about what you want agendized. Um, if, for example, Council Member LeBaron, if you want infrastructure generally, agendized, um, that's fine. If you want it to specifically um, address properties um, that have been addressed tonight, I would ask you to be specific about those things. And the, and the same thing with Council Member Stowe's, please be specific so that staff understands what you want brought back. So for the, I would like to propose that we uh, agendize adopting the uh, ceasefire resolution um, in addition a, the resolution also calls for the immediate release of all hostages um, I would like to agendize that and um, I'll be the second So we have the support of two council members, so that will appear on a future agenda, um, subject to availability on, on the um, schedule. Uh, and then I would turn it over to council member LeBaron if she'd like to ask for support from her council members. Thank you, city attorney Kristen Steinke. I would, I'm making the fast after many, many meetings of people coming forward to ask us that we hear their cries for help, people who live right here in Lemon Grove who are crying out to us for help, meeting after meeting, especially given the recent storms, I am going to ask my colleagues if you would support the community in agendizing a discussion on these storm drains, storm inlets, uh, 
culverts that seem to be failing at this point in regards to Austin Thomas on Drexel Court, Pat and David on Haven Street, Craig and Stephanie, Andrew and Jewel on Eddington Street, and Debbie Tellis on Central Avenue. Does the community have anyone else's support in agendizing conversations on the issues that they all brought before us tonight? So uh, I have had the opportunity to talk to at least about 56 people who've been impacted by the storm. Um, I, in addition to this meeting, the last meeting we heard from a lot of people. Uh, that's why I, I, we had scheduled and as a as a council member and council member group and the mayor, we voted to have the workshop because I don't think we understand the scope of the problem yet. So to have like singular meetings to discuss particular items, um, I I would support an an agenda item after we have the workshop and get the information and knowledge and get consensus from the community and, and have listened to the entirety of this community that's been impacted, uh, I, I would support that. Uh, so I would support the modification um, to Council Member LeBaron's request that we in the future agendize this, but I would, I would say after we have the workshop and understand the scope of the problem and then I would support it to be more general than specific because I, I don't think it's fair to help, help just a small population that are able to show up to this meeting. I surely appreciate all the voices that have come and, and heard, but I think we have to understand the scope of the problem before we start drilling down into individual, uh, individuals' uh, private properties. And so if, if the council member LeBaron would be amenable to that, that's what I'd be willing to agendize. The public is here before us asking that we agendize their issues, the ones that they have just brought up. They actually explicitly said that and what they said. They said, we would like you to agendize our matters. That's what I heard them say, these people here. So the ask is today, the same way that you just took up agendizing their ask is great. The ask is that we respond to these people here, our community members and that we agendize what they've asked us to agendize in a very roundabout way, you have just said no. Um, our job as council members is to agendize stuff because that gives staff direction to work on this because that's their jobs. It's our jobs to give direction to our full-time paid staff who are the experts to put, to put in the research and work to inform us because not, none of us are experts or full-time employees of the city. That's why we give them direction. That's why we put things on the agenda you are about to instruct staff to use staff time to agendize something that is near and dear to you, near and dear to many. Yes, it's very important. These folks are just as important. So it's a no from you. Do I have a yes from anybody else? Does the community have a yes from anybody else? Sorry, let me rephrase that. Well, I'm I'm gonna agree with Council Member Snow, so I have a yes, that this will be on a future agenda. That so was the yes. question I posed. Uh, I'm asking to agendize. I, uh, we, we already know what you're asking. Okay, so it's and a no from you as well. A yes to Council Member Snow. Okay. Russell Vasquez. Mayor, these people are suffering in the here and the now. They, they want answers to now. Uh, that's Mayor Raquel Vasquez. Thank you very much. And what I will do is lean to our city attorney to see what is um, legal uh, regarding this discussion that we're having right now on an item that item that's not agendized. Well, I'm not hearing support for the for the item that correct. Council Member LeBaron has proposed. That is correct. And I would ask if there are any other um, asks for for agendizing a different item. This is a question for the city attorney. Um, one of the concerns I have is addressing like individual issues um, that might become uh, litigation in the future. And so that, that's part of my hesitancy is if we start hearing one at a time, um, we have to have, like as council members, we can't 
and just like like addressing that like every single person who comes here and just that we didn't come here we'd be favored for. I that's that's not I I'm, I'm just concerned about the legality of handling these one at a time without getting the entire picture and, and making it look like a bias. That's how you prevent litigation, ma'am, is by talking to people, by putting them on the agenda so we can have a conversation so that they don't sue us. Okay, so um, at this point in time, I'm going to limit the comments um, because we really need to move along with our agenda. Um, what I know is a priority is our own backyard. And I am, focused on making sure that we take care of the needs of our community. I know, I know right now, um, we have a workshop that is agendized. What I'd like to know is when will the workshop take place? And I wanna make sure that every person who has been impacted by the storm is aware that this workshop is happening so that we can have a robust conversation uh, moving forward. I think that as part of that workshop, we can make a, de a decision or a determination what the next step will be. And so um, just know that city staff is putting together a workshop. And the difference between what you see here tonight, this is a business meeting, okay? And so we have specific agenda items uh, and, there, and we're limited on what we can say and what we can do here at the platform. But in a workshop, we are able to have free-flowing conversations and to gain knowledge about what your true challenges are and then to build strategies moving forward to try and remedy those challenges. And so that workshop is very important. In the meantime, I believe that my city manager did share some important information about resources that can be tapped into. I implore everybody to tap into those resources, um, the grants and all of the FEMA money that will be available to those who have been impacted. Um, but I think moving forward, that first giant step, that first leap is to actually get everyone together so that we can take a look at what our true issues are and then work together to build a strategy. We can work together to build a plan and that would be the most effective way to move forward to address the issues. Um, what I'm talking about here is not just sharing dialogue, but really making sure that you know, we are focused and intentional on what we are doing out in the community as it relates to the betterment of Women Grow, and then making sure that we actually have the funding to do just that. Are these so I hope that. Recorded? Um, no, they're not recorded. None of it's on the So um, I hope that um, I get an idea of exactly when that workshop is going to take place. I want to make sure that residents that have been impacted are notified. Madam Mayor, City Council, we, um, um, my executive assistant sent out a survey to the City Council to get a date that works best for all of the City Council members. Um, we were hoping to do the um, first beginning of March. I've heard back from four of the five City Council members to set the date. Because this is an important issue, I'm going to make sure that the complement is there. So we're just waiting for one more response until we can actually set the date. What we're looking at is either alternate Tuesdays or um, a Saturday to have the conversation. I'm so, the one who's right. and I'm available whenever the whole council is available. Just let me know what day and I'll be there. Uh, thank you so very much. And so I think that we have a plan, a strategy moving forward. And for those who did come out tonight to talk about uh, the storm and the most pressing issues, uh, thank you. And just, uh, know that you will receive notice regarding the workshop. How will they receive the notice? Uh, thank you so very much. How are we going to get the notice? Are you going to mail it out to us and call us, email us? I'll have um, city staff follow up with your question. It's going to be three hours of telling you guys all about storm drains, but not about
We will we will notify the public by um, again it'll be publicly noticed like this meeting is publicly noticed so if you haven't signed up already sign up to get all of our agendas um, via our website then we will also advertise it on our social media and um, Facebook account and um, um, I just I want to not take um, questions from the audience uh, if you have a question after you can stay and we can talk or you can um, ask. Uh, or you can just email me at City Hall and I will respond on how we will let you guys know when the meeting is. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, next, we are moving on to our consent calendars. And um, we did receive notice from Council Member LeBaron for items 1B, 1D, and 1E. Those will be taken up after a report to Council are complete. And so um, we have a motion to approve the consent calendar minus 1B, 1B, and 1E. I so move. I have a second. We have a motion and a second. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Yes, the motion was made by Council Member Snow with a second by Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza. Roll call vote. Council Member Snow? Aye. Council Member LeBaron? Council Member LeBaron? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza? Aye. Mayor Vasquez? Aye. The motion passes on a vote of 401, with one member being absent. Thank you. We do not have any public hearings tonight, and so we will move forward to item number two, which is a discussion on recommended street rehabilitation for streets within a pavement condition index of 25 or below. This item was continued from our last council meeting on January 16th and the February 6th meeting. And so I'll turn this over to Izzy Morgia, our public works director, to present the staff report. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. Tonight's presentation is to review staff's recommendation to rehabilitate streets with a pavement condition index, also known as PCI, uh, of streets that have a rating of 25 or above, to be included in the FY23-24 street rehabilitation project. Slide, please. The city's street system consists of 70 centerline miles. The city undertakes a pavement management program to prioritize street maintenance and rehabilitation each year. The pavement management program is conducted every five years and it provides a roadmap for which for the city to address streets, um, to address streets for rehabilitation and maintenance based on uh, specific types of treatments uh, and based on available funding. The city most recently completed its payment management program in April 2023 and that uh, PMP uh, stretches all the way from 2023 and it goes through 2028. The PMP provides, a, as I mentioned, a roadmap for uh, rehabilitation and maintenance um, every five years. There is an assessment done on every street in the city. We have an inspector that walks every every street in the city and provides it uh, a grade, a rating from zero to 100. 100 being uh, a fully, a new street, reconstructed street, or a newly paved street uh, with zero being a very, very poor, uh, poor street, uh, meaning it needs reconstruction. <clears throat> For the past uh, several years, I mean, since uh, 2017, since the passage of SB1, also known as the gas tax, uh, the city has completed an annual street rehabilitation project with a focus on preserving streets in good condition, uh, maintaining arterials, and performing overlay work, or also known as uh, reconstruction, uh, as funding allows. The fiscal year 23-24 budget includes $1.16 million uh, from the American Rescue Plan Act, uh, 
funding dedicated for streets with a PCI rating of 25 or, or below. The PNP that was adopted and accepted by the council in 2023 identified 105 street segments uh, with a rating of 25 or below. Uh, this is approximately about 22, 23% of the street network in the city. And just to provide some context, um, I'm sorry, can you put it next slide? Just to provide some context, the uh, 105 street segments that were identified with having a 25 PCI uh, or below, uh, cumulatively, if, if the city had unavailable or unlimited funds to fix those 105 segments, uh, it would cost about $11.3 million. As part of the budget, the FY23-24 budget uh, that was adopted, uh, the council held a CIP workshop uh, in which it identified uh, 20, uh, me, 20, it identified five selection criteria uh, for selecting streets with a 25 uh, rating or below. And based on uh, feedback from from the count from the council, uh, those criteria were uh, one cost, two connectivity, uh, meaning we want to address whole blocks and not half blocks of streets. And this was feedback that was provided based off of um, the prior year's PNP and um, uh, you know the practice of addressing you know, half blocks or or partial lanes or, or, or whatnot. So uh, <clears throat> number three is maximizing the number of residences, maximizing the number of streets and square footage. Four, uh, proximity to parks, government facilities, uh, and schools. And then five, uh, location to commercial corridors. Uh, for example, Broadway, Massachusetts, Skyline, uh, so major arterials uh, in the city. In addition, uh, in addition, staff has uh, uh, look, is looking at two additional criteria in making the, tonight's recommendation uh, before the council, and, and that's um, utilizing uh, the available funding and. Uh, making an equitable distribution among uh, zones throughout the city. Uh, so I'll, I'll go into that here in a bit. And then also looking at uh, past or upcoming projects. Uh, so recommending streets that um, uh, that may have had, that or that is nearby a street that was perhaps rehabilitated or repaired in years prior or that is, or that are coming up. Uh, again, to build upon the connectivity criteria. Next slide, please. So as part of staff's um, uh, recommendations, uh, we utilize a, a zone map, a zone maintenance zone, uh, to help us with our, our maintenance. So we divided the city into four zones. Uh, zone one, uh, which would be the top left-hand corner, Zone one, on the east, north side of the, the northeast corner of, of the city, zone two, uh, bottom west, southwest corner, zone three, and then zone four. Um, and so we're utilizing this, this map to uh, bring forward and develop our, our street recommendation list. Next slide, please. So in these next couple of slides, um, I will be going through each zone and discussing the streets uh, that staff's recommending for, for repair. Um, upon completing uh, each of the, the, the zones, uh, we've also presented alternatives for council's consideration. Um, those alternatives are not in any way um, 
prioritizer anyway. They, there are, uh, as I mentioned, alternatives. So if the council so choose, uh, you know, swap out a street from one of the alternatives um, with one of the recommended, recommended streets. Uh, and then from there, we'll discuss next steps um, as far as what the, uh, what the project would look like to, to get this uh, uh, project, project uh, out to bid and, and, and completed. And then the last thing I'll mention that just because the streets uh, um, may be on the alternative uh, list, uh, there's still an opportunity to include those as a bid additive in our uh, bid package. So if the bids come in low, um, we could draw, um, we could go down the list of, of streets uh, uh, to, to be able to repair uh, those streets on the alternative list if, if funding is available. So beginning in zone one, uh, again, this is the zone on in the uh, northwest corner of the city. Uh, staff's recommending uh, the rehabilitation of Pacific Avenue from uh, essentially the entire corridor of, of Pacific Avenue. The first, first segment um, is Vista Avenue to Citrus Street. And Joel, can you go to the next slide real quick? This is really difficult to see, and I apologize for that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, so Pacific Avenue from from Vista to Citrus Street, um, essentially, uh, the, thank you. Actually, this works well. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so we're looking at this segment, and so Pacific Avenue from Vista to Harris Street would be the first segment. The area that's uh, circle here, which would be from Harris Street to Buena Vista, was recently uh, paved, and it has a PCI index of uh, 76. And so when we're looking at presenting this street for rehabilitation, uh, one, we're looking at uh, the number of residences on the street, um, the previous, any previous maintenance or rehabilitation done on this street to complete the entire corridor segment. Uh, so, from excuse me, Pacific Avenue from uh, Vista to, to Citrus, and then from Citrus to Harris, and from New Jersey Avenue to Buena Vista Ave. Then we, uh, because this segment here was, was paved recently um, and it, it's in uh, a good condition, we would pick up again on Pacific Avenue uh, from Buena Vista to Olive and continue to Main Street. When we're looking at the, the uh, uh, cost for the project, So before I get on the cost, I, that's that's the first uh, recommended street. Um, the second recommended street for uh, Zone One would be Vista Avenue from Pacific Avenue to Central, and it's um, falls right aligned here. Vista Avenue has about 48 residences, 23,000, almost 24,000 square feet of, of pavement. Um, the street itself is uh, would cost about 93,000. Go, can you go back to the next slide? To the previous slide, sorry. So when we're looking at costs, um, here are the segments again. So we're, we're looking at uh, various segments for Pacific Avenue, but in its totality. We're looking at uh, if the council so chose to do Pacific Avenue, we would be able to knock out the entire corridor of Pacific Avenue based off of the previous project that was completed for that segment of Harris to Buena Vista. 
This avenue is being proposed, again, due to the uh, high number of residences, its connectivity to uh, Broadway, um, Broadway to, uh, this is on, on this uh, avenue, Broadway to uh, Pacific is in the uh, FY 23, 24 uh, PMP, so we are going to be, a, we were going to be addressing that street anyways. And so uh, being in this area allows us to tackle that, in, that uh, entire street. Uh, proximity to public facilities, again, Pacific Avenue, uh, at least the, the latter part of the, the uh, street. Um, it is uh, closest to you know, City Hall, Tregansi Park, and the Sheriff's Substation. And so it, it checks off that, that box. Uh, all streets here check off the box between, uh, or check off the box of, of being adjacent to a commercial corridor. Um, when you look at Pacific Avenue in itself, uh, it has about 74 residences. Uh, that's not including the multifamily uh, complexes that, that have multiple units. So we're looking at approximately over 100 uh, residences uh, themselves on Pacific Avenue. Uh, PCI wise, uh, as you as you can see here, uh, all the PCIs for Pacific Avenue segments are under 20, uh, making it a good candidate. Um, and then uh, this the Avenue as well as under under 20. <clears throat> Zone one in totality has a total sum of $395,000 uh, to, to repair all the streets uh, in zone one. This is obviously an estimate. Um, and when we look at each of the zones, we want to stay around the $400,000 range to uh, be within the $1.16 million at the uh, council have, uh, had allocated as part of the ARPA funding. All right, uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so this image here, again, it's difficult to, to see if I apologize. Um, the items in green, which would be, Items in green are the streets that we're recommending as part of the streets under 25 PCI. So it'd be Pacific Avenue, and then uh, Vista Avenue between uh, Central and uh, Central and Pacific. The yellow streets, and again, it's difficult to see, um, and we'll get to these alternatives here soon, but um, the alternative streets um, are Cedral Place, Lemonwood Lane, uh, which is here, Lemonwood Lane, Mercury Lane, I'm sorry, Mercury Drive, and then Drew Lane, uh, which is over here. And we'll get to those alternatives. Uh, the streets in blue are streets that are identified in the current pavement management program. So uh, Massachusetts from, I'm sorry, Broadway from Massachusetts to North, uh, heading westbound, uh, Massachusetts, sorry, did I, I thought I said Massachusetts, excuse me, Broadway from Massachusetts to north, westbound, uh, Massachusetts from uh, Central Avenue to uh, the northern city limits. Um, we have a project on uh, Olive from Pacific to, uh, to Church. And then again, Olive, uh, Olive from Central to Brunei, or Brunel, excuse me. And then uh, Cuyamaca uh, between, uh, or Cuyamaca Street. Um, and then uh, Amber, Amber Lane is also identified as a project for this year. Can we go to the next slide, please? Zone two, so zone two uh, is the northeast corner of the city. And when we're looking at 
zone two uh, staff is recommending uh, three streets uh, on on in zone two. Uh, the first street is Camino de las Palmas from Palm Street to Calle to Calle Sur. Uh, this segment here has a, 20, a PCI of twenty four uh, at a price of about two hundred and five thousand uh, dollars. Camino de las Palmas. Uh, has approximately 44 residences. It is a very wide street, um, and hence the, the larger price tag for, for this recommendation. <clears throat> um, it is uh, proximity proximity to public facilities. If you're on the northern end of Camino de las Palmas, um, you, know, you have the, um, uh, the Lemon Grove school district, early childhood uh, center that's being built currently, or in the process of being built, and um, the education facility uh, that's, that's located uh, on Palm Street. It checks the box of being on a commercial corridor, uh, meaning Palm Street is a, is a uh, uh, collector street arterial, so uh, we check that box there. Calle Norte, uh, Calle Norte is another street on, it's, it's off Camino de Las Palmas, has a PCI of 22. It's a cul-de-sac street, not that much square footage. Um, there's about six, six homes there. Um, this street's being recommended because of its low, obviously it's low PCI, but it can't be ad addressed. Uh, it would not be right to not address that street if, if we're there on Camino Los Palmas and, and paving you know, Los Palmas. Um, given that it's such a, a small square footage. The third recommended street is Acacia Street, um, and that is on off of Golden Avenue, and this is a cul-de-sac. There's about um, 27 homes on this street, has a PCI rating of 16. Uh, at about $84,000. It's proximity to facilities, uh, checks that box. Um, it is near the um, uh, Lemon, Lemon Grove, oh, sorry, Lemon Grove School. Uh, right, yeah, I forget the name, but the elementary school, yeah. Uh, thank you, Councilman. Um, and then additionally, uh, to, about connectivity, uh, Golden Avenue was uh, repaved uh, from uh, School Lane to Kemp Street. And so um, repaving Acacia would bring um, that area, um, would bring it up to a higher PCI. So um, having uh, better a better network system uh, on Golden Avenue. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, bear with me here. Uh, so this street here in blue is School Lane, and it's from uh, Golden <coughs> Avenue to Central, and that's on the uh, list to be uh, paid as part of the city's PMP. <coughs> Nida Place, which is here, uh, this street is scheduled to be paved not as part of the PMP, but as part of the city's uh, CDBG road rehabilitation program, so it's on the FY2324 CDBG uh, road project. Um, so you have that Mida Place being paved there. Uh, Hardy Drive is on the PMP for this year. And then uh, Myra Street is scheduled to be paved. And these are uh, streets in blue. And then uh, Broadway uh, from Sweetwater Way to Lemon Grove Way is scheduled to be paved. The streets on the alternative list, um, which we'll get to here shortly, um, 
is Kemp Street from Golden Ave to Lincoln Street. Right around here. Longdale Drive. Um, it's a cul-de-sac Longdale Drive. Um, that street's on the recommend or alternative list from Skyline to the end of the cul-de-sac. And the other alternatives are Crestline, Haven, and Mulder. Um, and then again, if we just touch base again on the streets that are recommended, it's Camino de los Palmas, which is here, Acacia Street, which is here. Next slide, please. Zone three, which is the south west corner of the city. Staff's recommending McKnight Street um, from Camelot Court. So essentially McKnight Street from um, San Pasqual Court all the way to the end of the, the cul-de-sac that it traverses Mount Vernon Street and then there's a, a small cul-de-sac that um, McKnight um, in its entirety is being recommended for, for rehabilitation. Uh, McKnight has, uh, in especially those two top segments from Camelot to San Pasqual and Mount Vernon uh, to Camelot Court, have a PCI rating of 10. Um, which is really bad. Um, when we look at McKnight Street as, as an entirety, um, we have um, you know, a, a good number of residences uh, on McKnight. Uh, McKnight is also a pretty wide street, and so um, you know, it covers a larger square area, which means a higher cost. Uh, for McKnight, uh, in, in totality, um, we're looking at about you know, close to 200,000 for, for McKnight. The next segment is El Prado Avenue from Benita Street to San Pasqual. Um, that has a PCI 24 um, and cost of about 53,000. Um, it's a smaller segment, um, but it is, they, there, it is, um, in, and I'll show you here in a map, uh, there are segments of El Prado that have a higher PCI in the uh, 70 to 80 range due to it being paid uh, in prior years. And so this would, uh, this would complete the, the El Prado Avenue corridor and bring the entire corridor and up that PCI average um, uh, into a very uh, good condition. Bonita Street from Barrel Street to El Prado Avenue is being recommended at a cost of 134,000. Um, there is uh, a lot of homes on that street. That street, this street here is, is being recommended. Um, one, um, due to its, its connectivity to El Prado. Um, there is a development uh, on uh, Bonita Street that is being constructed. So we have in lieu fees from developer to repay Bonita Street um, from, uh, I believe it's Mount, not oh, no, Mount, from, um, get my notes, bear with me. Barrel Street um, to uh, from Barrel Street, I think there's probably um, I want to say there's a couple hundred feet the width of the Bonita Street project. Uh, it doesn't go to a, 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 a intersection, but uh, we have some in lieu fees from that developer to, to, to repave uh, Bonita Street, uh, and so this would provide the opportunity to. Um, connect 
uh, from industry from barrel all the way to all product. Can you go to the next slide, Joel? So McKnight runs, again, uh, a little bit north of Mount Vernon, the cul-de-sac, and goes all the way down to Santa Squall. Uh, then we have El Prado, which is this segment here, uh, from El Prado to Benita Street. El Prado from Benita Street to Barrel, which goes up here. This segment has a PCI uh, in the 70s. Uh, so doing El Prado to Benita Street would bring up the average PCI for the El Prado Avenue corridor. Um, additionally, this street was recommended because San Pasquale Street is on the city's recommendation, or I'm sorry, the city's PMP list for this year. So doing San Pasquale from El Prado uh, to, I believe it goes to uh, San Pasquale Court, um, would allow this segment here to El Prado, to Bonita Street, up to Barrel, um, repaved. Additionally, uh, and that's why we're also recommending that Knight Street, so you'd get the center of Zone 3 uh, repaved. Additionally, we have Mount Vernon from McKnight to Bonita Street, that's on this year's uh, PMP list. So, which is another reason why McKnight was selected. You would get this, uh, this corridor here uh, redone with, with the ARPA funds. Uh, other streets in Zone 3 that are being completed, uh, or that will be completed, is Sonoma Lane. Uh, again, this is, these are streets that are on the PMP this year, so uh, I'm just going over these for, for context. Uh, and uh, Avalon, uh, which is down at the bottom of Zone 3. Streets that are being uh, recommended as alternatives, uh, and we'll go over the, the entire list of the alternatives here shortly, uh, is uh, my glasses, so, um, is Primera, there's Primera, uh, La Corta, it's a horseshoe that uh, is off of Massachusetts, and um, or I can't pronounce the street, but uh, Calle Andre. Um, uh, those are on the alternatives list. Um, Berryland, which is off of San Pasqual. Pergle Street uh, is being uh, recommended as an alternative. Barrel Street uh, from Maine to Bonita. And then Buena Vista uh, from Main Street to, um, uh, I think I believe it's, uh, oh, Davidson, sorry, I couldn't read the, the map on my, on my uh, copies here. So, um, Buena Vista from uh, Main Street to, to Davidson uh, is on the alternatives list. Next slide, please. Zone four, which is the south east corner of the city. Uh, again, we're seeing Camino de los Palmas being recommended uh, due to its low PCI. One of the bigger, larger uh, uh, ticket prices, I guess, for lack of better words, costs uh, due to its it's width, um, but the number of residences, we have 37, um, you put together the segment in zone two, um, and then you have a little over uh, 50 residences. Uh, square footage, you know, we're looking at close to 44,000 uh, square feet. Um, 
you know, staff selected this street. Um, you know, we do get, uh, it's, it's one of the streets that does get a number of complaints, um, but when you have one-time money to, to be able to provide a one-time big impact um, was the reason why we also selected this street in addition to the criteria that you provided. Um, looking at, um, in addition to um, evaluating these, these streets, these streets are don't, don't fall in the uh, PMP for the next five years. Uh, so it provides an opportunity to address streets that currently would not be able to get addressed with the funding available that the city has. Uh, Lawton Drive is the second second street from Mount Vernon to uh, the end of the cul-de-sac. It has a PCI reading of 10 or below at a cost of about $78,000. Um, it is a has about 12 residences, uh, 12, 20,000 square feet, um, and it is uh, access to a commercial corridor. Um, that being, Mount uh, Vernon Street. And then lastly, Lansing Drive, uh, from Camp Drive to Skyline, has a PCI of 20, um, then you have a higher sticker price of uh, 177,000. You have a, a good number of residences on this street, uh, 45 plus, and um, you know this street is, a, is definitely a long run uh, from Skyline to, to Canton. Um, if you look at the western side of, of uh, Lansing Drive and its proximity to um, the uh, Monterey Heights Academy. Um, it, it is close to um, that public facility as well as the, the Little League Monterey Heights Park. And, and so um, uh, that was one of the reasons why we selected Lansing Drive. Next slide, please. And so, uh, again, apologize, bear with me here with the the streets, uh, Lansing Drive from Skyline all the way to Canton is recommended. Uh, Lawton Drive, so from Mount Vernon to the end of the cul-de-sac. And then Camino de las Palmas, which picks up from uh, Calle del Sur, which again was recommended in zone two. And it goes all the way down to Illico Street. Um, <clears throat> the streets that are being conducted as part of this year's PMP um, we have uh, Nickel Street, uh, uh, Fairfax, which is off of um, Lansing Drive, which is the reason why we, we selected Lansing due to its connectivity here. Um, <coughs> Circle Drive, which is up here on the uh, top corner of zone four. And then uh, we have a number of streets uh, off of Ildica Street that are being um, recommended for, for paving as well. The alternatives for zone four um, is Noble Street, which is off of Ensenada, Fairhaven, and Glencoe from Alton to Eldora, and Hughes Street, uh, which is down in this area here, are on the, the alternatives list. Can we go to the next slide, please? So these uh, streets here are the alternatives to the recommended, the recommended streets that staff has proposed um, in no particular order as far as priority goes, just uh, to, to reiterate that. Um, <clears throat> these are good candidates as well. Uh, our first candidate uh, as an alternative street on, uh, for zone one is Cedral Place. Um, again, it has a PCI 20 at about 82,000. It meets the connectivity 
a checkpoint, uh, meaning that uh, Jemiah Place was uh, paved uh, in the past two years. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Amber Place is scheduled to be in PMP this year. So uh, Dewey Cedral will, would, uh, um, would complete the paving for that entire neighborhood. Um, you know, Cedral Place has about 20 residences, 21,000 square feet area uh, of, of pavement. Um, and then as far as it being close to uh, public facilities, it is um, approximately 1,100, uh, 1100 uh, feet from uh, San Miguel Elementary. Uh, next candidates for alternatives is Lemonwood Lane uh, from the, from the cul-de-sac to Mercury Drive has a PCI of 25, about $95,000 to address. Uh, connectivity, um, uh, uh, 27 homes, 24,000 square feet. Uh, again, it's it's about 1,200 feet from um, San Miguel Elementary. Mercury Drive, is being proposed as well. Uh, Mercury has a lower PCI. Um, Mercury Drive is a really wide street, and, um, and so you, you see the higher uh, cost uh, to address the street here. Um, we have checked off uh, connectivity uh, because if you, uh, uh, it's assumed that if you do uh, Mercury Drive, Council selected Mercury Drive, you, you would also want to do Lemon Wood Lane or vice versa. Um, and again, Mercury Drive uh, leads into Lemon Wood Lane and uh, it's in close proximity to San Miguel Elementary. Drew Lane is on the alternatives for Zone 1 as well, and this would wrap this wraps up Zone 1 alternatives um, from San Miguel to the end of the cul-de-sac. It is one of the uh, um, more worst streets uh, of, on the alternatives list, meaning it's um, less than 10 PCI. Uh, it is also a pretty wide street, and so you see a uh, higher price tag. Uh, but if you look at the number of residences, you know, 56, uh, which is, is pretty high when you're looking at maximizing households or benefiting that, uh, benefiting households. And then with regards to the commercial corridor, um, San Miguel Avenue is a collector, and so it's a, a low traverse street and having access to, to that corridor. Um, zone two uh, recommended streets are Crestline Drive, from Palm Street to Haven. So these next three streets are being rec recommended as an alternative. Uh, the council wanted to address these streets instead. Um, that recommends, it, recommends that they are addressed as a package. Uh, these streets are located off of Palm Street. There are, uh, you know, a horseshoe, uh, shaped as a horseshoe off of Palm Street. Um, staff recommends um, you know, Crestline Drive from Palm Street to Haven Drive, which has a PCI of 10 at about 100,000. Uh, Crestline then connects to Haven, uh, and that has also a PCI of, of 10 or below. And then Haven Drive connects to Mulder Street. Uh, Mulder Street from Haven to Palm, and uh, I can go back to a map to see where, where this, uh, these streets are located, but um, uh, Mulder Street has a PCI of 30, and so um, there's a, a caveat here uh, that uh, while the ARPA funds were funded with uh, for streets under 25 PCI, uh, staff is recommending that that if the alternatives, if this if these streets were recommended to to be addressed, that we include uh, Mulder Street uh, to complete the. Uh, the, the, the circle per se um, uh, for these streets off of Palm. Next slide. Um, 
long bill drive from Skyline Drive to the east cul-de-sac is being recommended as an alternative for zone two. Uh, and then these next two streets, Kemp Street, essentially from Golden Avenue to Lincoln Street. Um, so from, uh, and this would, would address um, uh, that, that corridor that's next to um, Eleven Grove Middle School. For zone three, uh, we pick up on uh, here at Barrel Street, Benita Street to El Prado Avenue, um, which has a PCI of 10 or below about 50,000. Um, this is, is being recommended. Um, one, again, uh, it would you know, the city, uh, the city council elected to do the, re the recommended streets. Um, that's one thing. Um, but if it's selected to do Barrel Street, it, it would still address that uh, area on the uh, uh, that center pocket of, of Zone Four. Uh, Barrel Street from El Prado Avenue to Main Street uh, is being recommended. We would recommend that, that these two would go in tandem. Uh, Buena Vista Avenue from Davidson to Main. Um, this street here is recommended because Buena Vista from Davidson Avenue to Central has a really high PCI. Um, it was, uh, that segment was repaired in recent years. And so uh, fixing this essentially last segment here would, would bring uh, Buena Vista Avenue, um, Buena Vista Avenue's PCI uh, to a higher average. And then lastly, as the alternatives, is Purple Street, um, <clears throat> which has a PCI of 21 at about 68,000. Um, and Purple Street is, is being recommended because um, it is adjacent to uh, a street that was recently repaired. And so it, can, it checks off the connectivity box. Next slide, please. The following three streets are recommended to be uh, taken in tandem uh, as, as part of alternatives. Uh, so um, these streets are, uh, so Barrowland Court is off of Sampa Squall. As I mentioned, Sampa Squall uh, from El Prado uh, to Berryland. To Berryland is being addressed in, the, in this year's PMP. Uh, and so this street is being recommended as an alternative um, because uh, a contractor would be in that area anyways. And so it would, it would check off the connectivity box and, um, and it being uh, adjacent to a commercial corridor. Uh, the next streets, Calle Entre, La Corta, and Primera Street, uh, those all those streets also are a U-shaped, a horseshoe-shaped um, corridor off of uh, Massachusetts, and so these streets um, are being recommended as a package. Um, their PCI uh, again is uh, below below ten, um, and um, we're looking at a, a cost of over the $200,000 range to address those three streets. Uh, and then lastly, uh, zone four, the alternatives for zone four are Nobel Street uh, from Lawford Place to Eldora, which has a PCI of below 10 at about 119,000. Um, Fairhaven Street, from Eldora Street to Glencoe, has a PCI of 18. And then Glencoe Drive from Alton Drive to Eldora Street, which has a PCI of 10 or below. Uh, lastly, uh, Hughes Street from Lincoln Place to Glencoe Drive is being recommended as an alternative. Um, 
and that has been recommended due to the fact that um, uh, the streets uh, near a uh, few streets such as Bakersfield, Taft, Avocado uh, were paved in the city's uh, round, last round of uh, street rehabilitation. So that would connect, um, that would complete the paving for this, this area, uh, the Monterey, Monterey Heights community. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, the uh, uh, staff has recommended a, a list of recommendation, recommended streets. Uh, should those streets um, not line up with the council's priorities, we have identified alternatives. Um, that the council can uh, certainly uh, direct staff to uh, swap out. Um, but as part of the alternative analysis uh, that staff is and it's definitely, definitely proposing to council is, um, should the council uh, direct staff to address one to two additional streets per zone? Um, you know, staff would recommend appropriating approximately five, 500,000 in ARPA funds uh, to address one or two streets in the alternative list for each zone. Um, and how that would work is um, they would be included in the FY23-24 road rehab uh, bid packet. Uh, next slide, please. For our, so for our next steps, um, as I mentioned, our FY2324 uh, road rehabilitation project, um, uh, we would release a bid uh, by the end of the first quarter, which is next month. And um, you know, based on council's direction, uh, we would include a line item for streets under 25 PCI uh, in the bid packet. And that would be included uh, as part of the street, the city's overall street road rehab project. We're looking at a very significant road rehab project this year, given that um, not only does it include streets in FY23-24, um, but it includes streets in FY22-23, uh, which was the last year of the, uh, the city's most recent uh, pavement management program. Uh, so um, uh, we're looking at that last year of the PMP and those streets that, that uh, uh, weren't, weren't completed last year to include it in this year's bid packet. In addition, uh, we, would, we will have the streets under 25 PCI as part of that bid packet. The streets in the, uh, that are being recommended as alternatives, again, as I mentioned, um, there is a mechanism in our bid packet where we can do bid additives um, and we can just uh, list all the streets uh, on the alternatives list. And as the bids come in, if, should there be any funding available, um, we would take the first street on top of the, uh, the first street on the alternatives list and fund those one by one, as long as the funding is there from the bid results. Um, Again, we, rec we recognize that, that uh, realistically, um, you know, it, it would probably be um, maybe two to four streets um, if we get some competitive, competitive pricing. Uh, in addition, uh, we, would be, we, we are planning to put uh, street segments in our bid additives um, that are not in the PMP, um, but are uh, we recognize that our um, that need to be done. For example, uh, Canton, or I'm sorry, Skyline Drive from uh, Canton Drive to Mary Place. Um, just to give you guys some, uh, some some context, to do Skyline from from Canton all the way to Alton is a little over seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And mind you, our, our budget for road rehab is about 
any, in any given year, you know, 1.1 to 1.2 million dollars. So by adding it as a bid additive, um, whoever bids on this job, we're, we're hoping to get economies to scale, and so um, their uh, per square cost uh, would hopefully come down to be able to address uh, street segments such as that, or uh, address any streets in, in, uh, that we list as alternatives. Next slide, please. Uh, with that, staff's recommendation to receive tonight's report and provide direction on staff's recommendation to rehabilitate streets with a pavement condition index of 25 or below to be included in the 23-24 uh, street rehab project. Uh, at this time, that concludes staff's, rec staff's uh, presentation. I'm happy to answer any question. Again, I apologize for the uh, um, not good math qualities. Hope, hope I can answer your questions this evening and walk you through uh, our reasoning. Mr. Merguia, before we move to questions to the council, can you share, you talked about one of the rubrics as um, equity amongst the four regions. Can you talk about what that means in dollars? Certainly, thank you for that uh, clarification. So um, for, in terms of equity, each zone was allocated um, $400,000 uh, um, in, in, in its um, street selections. Um, there are, I think, one or two zones that, um, you know, slightly over, uh, like 426000 um, but cumulatively, the city's recommended streets total up to uh, 1.15 uh, million dollars, and what's budgeted uh, this year for ARPA is 1.6. Uh, so we're um, again, staying under that, that 1.6 threshold. That doesn't mean we're not doing fifty thousand dollars worth of streets. Again, we would tackle that uh, with the alternatives that are listed in the bid packet. Thank you so very much. Before we get to questions and comments, um, I do have some speakers with here, and I'll call on uh, Matt Kaczynski, followed by Brenda Hammond. Hi, my name is Max Strinsky with AFSCME um, Local um, 127. I want to thank everyone um, for your time. I thank um, the director for a great presentation. I know it's very detailed. Um, I want to say that our members support. I think this is an important issue. Um, I want to bring up, though, is that um, with all this work that's being done, as you may be aware, you may not, is the city does have paver, has two rollers, also has a dump truck that staff used to do this work. Um, they do not have a billing machine, though. And I think that when you're talking about this work that's going forward, um, there is the staff that used to do this, a lot of them have now retired or left. But I think there's potential to look at the long-term value of bringing this work in-house. Um, and maybe it doesn't happen today, but I think there's an opportunity that the city should look at, because um, this is not going to end. And do we bring this in-house where you can control the cost more, um, you can make sure there's a direction because what we saw with other bidding processes for other construction, sometimes you're only receiving one bid and you were stuck with that one bid. This way you can control it. And I think this is something probably the city uh, management part I'd like to see, I've heard from our members, is to actually bring this in house so that it can be done uh, with supervision um, for the city and so forth. So I, I again, I appreciate the proposal um, and taking care of the streets. Our, 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 our crew has to, to maintain them and, and patch them. Um, so it's important to stay ahead of the curve as best as possible. But I think also to look at um, how do you keep it in house if you can, um, but also if you are going in house, making sure those, those workers that are being hired are being treated with dignity and respect and they're also representing themselves. So thank you for your time. Thank you so very much. Next we have Brenda Hammond. I was just, I just want 
to say, um, I drive that bridge every night because that's like my senior mentor and friend. So if you see me driving by your house and not stalking you, I'm checking on you. <laughs> so, um, but I'm the community of Alex Thomas. I'm just curious. You guys like a roller coaster? Have you ever driven on it and just you're like this? So, so I'm, I'm wondering if that can ever be. I know it's going to always be that way because it's a spring that runs underneath that street and it runs all the way down Elderback. My parents, my parents bought a house <coughs> off of um, Boston Hill Court and they had to, their house was sliding on the Eldica, so they had to go down, they went down 30 feet and found water. So I'm just wondering, do, what do you do, just follow that? <laughs> I mean, when you, when you, when you, um, and finish okay. your comments and then right. staff will then address them. Okay. And then, um, so if you see me driving in the middle of the road, it's because I'm missing the potholes on the side. You know, with the rain, <coughs> the sides of the roads are, there's a lot of potholes. And then um, I've seen people driving the bike lane on the skyline just to get away from the potholes in the road. Thank you so very much. And so I'll look to staff to provide comments. <coughs> to address the speaker's questions, uh, so the work that's being recommended with the 25 DCI, we, it, it's essentially full reconstruction. So we would go down to, uh, to the base of both the road and, um, and rebuild uh, the street. Uh, so. Any inconsistencies, any inconsistencies in the road uh, would be addressed uh, due to the reconstruction of the street. Uh, the caveat is, you know, uh, there are uh, natural springs in the city, and we do have several locations where uh, water pops, pops up through the asphalt due to the natural springs. But um, as far as any uh, ways through through the street, those would be taken. Those would be addressed by reconstruct, reconstructing the street um, from base up. Okay. Thank you. And I will do two rounds of questions. Um, just know that it's two questions per round. And I'll start with uh, Council Member Snow. alternatives if we did um, consider the request to add an additional $500,000 to address our streets. In the list of alternatives, uh, does city staff or um, do you have uh, where you would recommend uh, those, which alternatives would be included in that additional $500,000? To answer your question, if, if I could address it by zone, that would be easiest, but for, for zone one, again, I. They're not prioritized in any uh, manner. Um, we recognize there's a lot of need in the city, so if it weren't these streets, or there'd be other streets that they could place. Um, but needless to say, that that put aside. Um, for the alternatives in Zone One, again, we have Cedarville Place, uh, Lemon Lemonwood Lane, Mercury Drive, and Drew Lane um, are the the streets that are in the alternative list uh, for Zone One. Um, and um, Drew Lane would be uh, a good candidate. Drew Lane has come up in the uh, city's CDBG uh, proposed list of, of streets, um, and that has made the recommended list um, uh, in years past, but, but hasn't been um, recommended for, for repair. So Drew Lane would be a candidate. Uh, again, Cedro Place would be a good candidate as well, just because we do have Janiah Place that was that was repaved. 
we have amber place up, up, up above um, that's being it's going to be repaved and so uh, uh, completing that three street neighborhood um, would, would close the, the circle there um, you know lemonwood lane and mercury drive um, Due to the width of the street, um, but uh, you know, if you're asking for staff's opinion, it would be, be you know, my one one two would be through Lane Single Place. Zone two, uh, zone two <coughs> for uh, recommendations. We have Crestline Drive, Haven Drive, Boulder Street. Those, that's the U-shaped, or the horseshoe-shaped uh, neighborhood off of Palm Street. And so I wouldn't recommend one of those threes on its own. It would, it would, it's a package, it's three or nothing. Um, Longdale Drive um, from Skyline Drive to east of, east of the cul-de-sac. And then uh, you have Kev Street. Kev Street. Um, from Golden Avenue to Lincoln Street is um, definitely needed, but it, it's really wide. So you'd be spending a, a big chunk of ARPA funds on, on this segment. Um, and so for, for Zone 2, I would recommend the Horseshoe uh, Streets. So Crestline Drive, Haven Drive, and Boulder. Um, additionally, you have off of Palm Street, you have Mida Place, Hardy, um, that will be done. And then the next seg segment of streets would be uh, these three. Um, and so you would get the south side of Palm Street, the entrances to those neighborhoods done uh, with that little bit of place. For zone three. Don't you have zone? Uh, which is the northeast corner. Zone three, which is the southwest corner. Um, just to run through the list of alternatives, we have Farrell Street from Bonita to El Prado, again, Farrell Street from El Prado to Main Street, uh, Buena Vista from Davidson to Main Street, uh, Purple Street. Um, and that's a uh, purple street. It's just one little segment. Um, I don't know if I'm off the map, but I, it, there's a street that that uh, leads into purple, and that street was recently done in, in years past. Um, so doing purple. Look at this. Um, <coughs> Fairland Court. High end entree, La Porta Street and Primera Street. Um, <clears throat> so for zone three, we, we've had a lot of complaints of for Buena Vista Avenue, mm -hmm. David said the name. Um, yeah. I, I mean, and Buena Vista from Davidson to Central has a, has a solid PCI, and so that would complete the, the Buena, Buena Vista Avenue uh, corridor. I mean, corridor is the, the segment of the street, so. Um, um, that, that would be a good candidate. Um, and zone four. Um, <clears throat> Zone four, we have Nobel, Fairhaven, Glencoe, and Hughes Street. And if you're looking for a recommendation for either of those four streets, um, you know, PCI-wise, They're, they, they were all needed. It's, it's difficult to uh, 
recommend a street here at, for this segment here, but um, I would say Nobel Street it is a pretty long street, and so being able to do that um, would be a good alternative. Okay. Um, And then uh, for the recommended ones, can you, uh, the number of residences for some of these we're missing in that last in the alternative chart. Yeah. Um, do you know how many residences are on Nobel? Forty-six. And on Buena Vista in Zone 3? Residences are on the two barrel street. In total, we have 29. And then on the uh, Rue Lane? Oh, so those ones we do have. Okay. All right, that's all my questions for right now. Thank you so very much. Next, I'll move on uh, to. Mayor Potem Mendoza, as Councilmember LeBaron has stepped away from the platform. Um, so I, I had actually come up with a list that was pretty much the same list that you see here. Um, and that was the adding uh, Crestline Haven and Mulder to zone even though the three of those would be 255,000, um, zone two is where we, we were spending the less money, which is 321. So it's, it's not, we're not <clears throat> spending incredibly more in that, in that zone. And then also, I think it would be a really good, and, and just because those three streets are all together right there. And we have had, uh, those neighbors in here uh, quite a bit to talk about their, their streets. Um, also, uh, I like the idea of, of Cedral because it would complete that whole little neighborhood. All the streets would be done there, and that's only 81,000. Um, again, Buena Vista, that completes uh, that area, and um, that would be 74,000, and then Noble, is 118,000. So you add those all together, and they come up to $498,000, which is pretty close to an additional 500. So I kind of like this uh, street the way it is. Um, and I did want to make a comment. We actually, not at last year's um, pavement management workshop, but at a previous workshop, did uh, when Mike James was with the city, we had a long discussion about bringing a lot of this work in house. Um, but um, with you know, once when after Mike left, the discussions kind of ended there. But we council members were very enthusiastic about doing that, and I think it's something that we definitely would like to aspire to in the future because we do have some of the equipment. And according to Mr. James, it would save us money to bring that, um, you know, bring a lot of that work in. But we need the staff also. So we have to hire an issue. Um, and that's been an issue. Um, uh, otherwise, I think um, I think followed our previous direction uh, very well. Um, we've had a couple months to uh, mull this over. 
on the agenda for a while, so I think it would be off, so I'm glad that we finally um, got, uh, got around to doing it. Another thing, you brought up Skyline, and another thing we talked about at one point is Skyline goes, kind of continues into the county, um, and a lot of the traffic on Skyline is going into Spring Valley and, and coming Same. back up because there's no direct access to the 125 except when you go down to the road there. So we had talked at one time about um, talking with the county about uh, bringing this a joint skyline uh, project, uh, especially at that, that one end of, of skyline, um, because that is a, a very heavily trafficked area, as you know, and uh, needs a lot of work. So I think that's all that I have for right now. Thank you very much for all of your hard work. Uh, thank you so very much. <clears throat> I just want to um, find out here if the five hundred thousand dollars of ARPA funds are allocated to do some of the alternative streets, um, where are we taking that funding from? Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, City Council, um, that remember we didn't allocate all of the six million um, from the ARPA fund. We held it back just in case we needed it, depending on what some of the infrastructure was. Um, there are some other programs and projects that are, are moving forward, so we just we kept it, that intentionally kept some back. So there is some additional funding in which we can use it for um, these streets for these purposes. I thank you so very much. And then I wanted to um, make sure that I have the right streets that um, Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza was recommending under the alternative category. So if you could um, run down those streets one more time for zone, thank you. All right, checking for understanding here. So we have, uh, what I noted was uh, Cedral, Cedral Place, uh, Novell, Crestline Drive, Haven Drive, and Boulder Street. Those are the streets that I uh, wraps up those. And um, you said Nobel, because I'm looking on the alternative. I uh, thank you very much. Um, Council Member LeBaron is back at the platform. And so you have two questions, Council Member LeBaron. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. I'm back. So, unfortunately, I missed what council member I was here for most of what Ms. Snow said. Um, however, so please, uh, if there's something that I'm missing, the council member follows up. Um, question about. So, let I'll say this actually, time and time again. Um, I'm so sorry, we, we are in the question portion of this meeting. If you can provide the two questions, otherwise we'll move to the second round where you can provide your comments, thank you. Thank you. Um, time and time again, we've seen where people come to our meetings and they mention- Council Member LeBaron, do you have questions? Yes, I do, Madam Mayor, and James. If you can ask your question, specifically the staff, thank you. 
um, time and time again, we've seen people come to our meetings and they've asked us questions, or they've asked that we agendize conversations on certain streets that are very, very dangerous and are riddled with potholes, and that are also very well traveled streets such as Madera, which is in zone three, and Skyline Street, which is in zone four. My questions are, because those are streets that, like I said, people have come and told us about that they should be fixed. Madera is right next to a school. Unlike Camino de los Palmas, which is not right next to a school and is actually in pretty good shape, uh, Madera is it's, oh, it's horrible. It is horrible, I can say that. And it's actually, there's a school on that street. So children are having to travel on this road with their families. It's a very dangerous street. Um, what is the what is the PTI of Madeira? Do you know that? I do know that. One second. Madeira has a PCI of one. Okay, and question. So understanding that we can choose however we would like to spend this money. We have a lot of freedom and flexibility to choose which streets we fit. Given that there's been so, there's, I mean, there's children on that street, there's a school on that street, and we've just heard so many people come to our company and telling us about Madera Street and how horrible it is, and, and you can witness it, you just drive down it. Um, why wouldn't that be considered as a street versus maybe like three other little streets? When, why wouldn't we consider that as an option to, let's maybe void out three little extra streets and put the money and I'm seeing that all these streets are like 70,000, 90,000, 50,000, let's say, to fix. So if we just accumulate all that money towards this one really bad street that's where there's a school, I think a lot of people would be very happy. Why don't we consider something like that? Or why hasn't that been considered as an option? So one of the criteria uh, that the council had established was costs part of our evaluation, and if uh, you take that one criteria, um, Madera Street, if we're going to repave the entirety of the street, uh, our estimate's 625,000 to do Madera Street, and so um, when we're, we're looking at our recommendation, again, we were looking at the zones, and equally distributing that 1.16, that 1.16 million that the council had allocated, which would, equates to 400,000 in each zone. Uh, and so that's why Madera Street wasn't recommended because it's half the money that the, the council had allocated. Um. I think that's my two questions. We're gonna have another round, right? Uh, yes, we will have another round and I'll start um, Thank you. with council member Snow. Um, you can ask your questions and provide comments. Thank you. So um, in the bid additive process, are the, al these alternatives, if we give you the 500,000, they're not, they wouldn't be considered in the bid additive process. And then would additional ones on the alternative list be on the bid additive? Do I have that right? Correct. Okay. And then, so next on the bid additives, how will you decide where, or how will you rank those? So for the bid additives, it essentially would come down to cost, comparing all the streets and um, what we 
staff feel uh, would be reasonable. Uh, for example, like 10% of um, the overall bid packet would be attributed to bid additives. Uh, backing into that number and um, going down the, the alternatives list and seeing which streets tally that, that amount. So I, I really appreciate the time and the effort that went into there. This kind of followed along the rubric that we had provided to staff um, and how we uh, listened to the community when we originally did the budgeting process and we talked about what was important to people and how um, we wanted to have equity amongst in higher living growth and that one area is getting more love than another area. Um, and so I really appreciate the time and effort that went into this and, and to the very careful, detailed explanation. Um, I'm inclined to uh, uh, receive the report and also um, provide staff with the direction that I want to include the additional $500,000. Our streets need a lot of this. Um, and we have a lot more to do and we look forward to increasing revenue so we can get more done. Um, Councilmember LeBaron's point on the Darren skyline are well taken. The skyline's about 750000 and the Darren 625000 um, It would be wonderful to get those streets done too, but we're going to need to increase our revenues to be able to do that. So with what we have right now, this is a very careful, well thought out, very equitable uh, distribution of assistance for our streets across the line. Um, so I would like to recommend that we add the additional 500000 uh, that the recommendations proposed by Councilmember Mendoza for as the alternatives for Zone 1, C Drill, Zone 2, the Crestline, Haven, Mulder, um, Triumvirate, Zone 3, Buena Vista, and Zone 4, Fernando Bell. And that we uh, proceed with the plan as outlined here. Is that a motion? Do we need a motion? No. Okay. To receive the report with the budget All right. Okay. Uh, Council Member LeBaron. I guess it's not so much a question, just as a comment to say that I mean, there, there does come a time when. So let's say, let's put it this way. I understand that equity right and you want it to be equitable there can be four different zones and there be minimal damage in all three of those zones and you have like four pair of, listen i'm just going to be simplistic with the numbers does there are four streets in each zone in these four zones and then in three of these zones there's like only damage to one over here and one over here but in this zone four there's like all four of those streets are damaged so you know, it doesn't make any common sense that, okay, well, we want to be equitable, so let's put one there and put one there and put one there. So it would make more common sense to put you know, more of the funds in that one zone that actually has a lot of really messed up streets. So that being said, I mean, Madeira is a horrible street. It's very terrible. Now I'm saying this, but another time it's not redundant. But there's a school on that street. So not only are there a lot of residents that live on that street, there's a lot of houses on both sides of those streets. So that's probably like, I don't know, at least 20 resident, 20 homes, way more than that. This is a way low number. But not only are there those residents on both sides, so 20 on that side, 20 on that side, that's a minimum because there's probably more. Um, there's also a lot more people who take their children to that school, Chan Altos, who are daily impacted by that street. So that is a really important street and I would hope that we could allocate some of this money towards that. Even a section of that would be such a huge win for our community. I mean, so many people would be so happy and their lives would be impacted for the better. Even if we put $200,000 towards fixing a portion of this road and maybe start at the top where Massachusetts, Massachusetts you know, Madera comes off of it. So even if we started here at the top and did like $250,000 work right there, I mean, that would be, Small wins. 
that's what I would that's my answer. Does anyone anybody agrees with wanting to throw some money at the bear? Great. That's what I think. I uh, thank you so very much. Uh, next we have Mayor Coxan Mendoza. <coughs> Thank you so very much. And I want to <clears throat> state here on the record that for the city of Lemon Grove, we actually have a $55 million backlog on um, streets that need to be paved and, and repaired. And that's a heavy lift for the city. It's projects. Um, that need TLC and every single street in our city needs TLC, um, but our funding is, is limited. The good news is that we actually have more funding than we've ever had before. And this is allowing us to address some of the streets that have never ever been touched before in the city. And we're doing just that right now at this platform. So um, I am okay with the recommended streets um, that have been suggested during our conversation and the allocation of an additional $500,000 to try and pave more streets. And just know I'm looking forward to the opportunity as we enter into our budget season that we take a look at the funding that we have to see how we can pave more streets here in the city of Living Grove. And that completes my comments. And so um, I just want to check with staff to see if um, you need any more direction from us. Uh, we have already completed the public comment portion of posted. the meeting for this um, this particular agenda item. Never and so, so we will move on to our next item as we have provided direction to staff. And the next item is uh, the items that were pulled from the consent agenda, which is item 1B, the Caymans and the Van. And so since Councilmember LeBaron asked that these items be pulled, specifically 1B, uh, item 1B, the Caymans and the Van. And 1E, uh, we'll start with item 1B. And so, uh, Councilmember LeBaron, um, can you ask your two questions of staff? So I have questions. I would like asking that we discuss how the public's money is being spent in public um, every month, particularly every month. And what's known as a consent calendar, calendar, there's what's known as the Lemon Grove payment demands. And that's where it's like a ledger of checks that have been cut in the past month and how many have been sent, spent, how the public's money has been spent. I always like asking questions about that so that the public can know, well, how our money is getting spent, right? Um, and I have questions about that. Specifically, I think it's like on page, uh, like the third page, Kristen, you're gonna be the one who needs to answer. And it's about legal fees, legal expenses. Um, everybody knows that attorneys are very expensive. And I don't think there's really many people who would think that spending a lot of money on attorneys is wise, right? It's always better to problem solve without needing to get lawyers involved and talk things through, be a community, try to be collaborative. Um, 
Um, so that said, check number one eight three seven one. Can you please explain to the public what all those charges are? They're in the total amount of twenty five thousand dollars for short time frame. It's the first to the thirty first of December. I believe that the best person to um, address that question would be our city manager, so I'll turn it over to our city manager. I want to see the city attorney if she's the one who's doing this work. It's literally her law firm. Oh, why wouldn't you answer this question, Kristen? You're the you're literally the one who's doing this for this. So the answer to your question, Councilmember LeBaron, is the first item is related to. Um, the. William, a lawsuit brought by Mr. Williams, um, the, or I should say pickaxe holding. The that case, the city of Lemon Grove? Yes. Okay, for the what, se- allegations of misconduct? Again, the second one you just asked, I don't know the ex- exact loss here, so this is why Kristen would be helpful to answer these questions. This so the second, the second item that you talked to is project for open government. Now, again, a lawsuit that the city is um, um, involved with. Is that one of the things not wanting to turn over public documents? The next next item is a second lawsuit from the Project of Open Government. Um, The next item is um, a a lawsuit that we are currently um, uh, working through. Daniel Owen, the um, the 813 charge, sorry, or is it the 1,700 charge? It's 813. Okay, so that's the case of a, oh, sure. the residents who are suing the city over a broken storm drain that they claim is the city's problem to fix. Okay, next. So this, the uh, the next one is again the Sutter versus Hutter um, lawsuit, and I believe that's that broken one storm drain, right? Yes, but I believe that one has been picked up by the Cal JPIA, our insurance carrier. Okay. Um, so the following along. Thank you. So then the next one. is another lawsuit with Pickaxe Holdings and the City of Lemon Grove. The next item is uh, bargaining negotiations um, with our public works group. The next item is general government, so it's for the city attorney to um, sit at these meetings um, and then answer general questions from, from staff. The next item is um, okay. Wait, the so remainder of uh, the on, wait, 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 one, one second, hold on. So the nine thousand dollars that we just paid for her last year to answer these kinds of questions. Okay. Then the next item is uh, then the last item on this um, on this wait, list. Wait, about David Arambula. What? What's that? This is the close of the David Arambula case. And uh, the Rambula versus Williams case. It's the close of that case. Okay, that's where the council member was accused of being somebody up. And, and that's the case that the city won, yes. Okay, got you. And then the uh, next case is, or the last one is, a 10, oh, 08, is another pickaxe holdings versus the city of Lemon Grove. What's that one for? Um, what is the person who's suing us alleging? Oh, this is Chris Williams, Mr. Williams, uh, pick at, pick at Holding and his attorney is Corey Briggs. What are they alleging is my question. Um, I have to read the lawsuit because I don't remember. Okay, the right. city attorney is right here. What are they alleging? It's your job. We're paying you to answer these kinds of questions, Kristen. Yeah, thank you. The, the last one that you just reviewed was the Pickaxe Holdings versus the City of Lemon Grove. Mm-hmm. Chris Williams is the principal of that uh, limited liability company. It's an inverse condemnation case and a writ of mandate for the denial of the extension um, on the deadline for the conditional use permit at that location for a marijuana dispensary. Okay, so in layman's terms, this person is re- doesn't agree with the city's decision on their denial? Unfortunately, okay. at this time, um, I will go ahead and um, um, take over complete with all the questioning here. Um, 
the council members asked way more than two questions. And so um, before we move forward with this agenda item 1B, and I will ask the council members to please stick to the two question um, guideline that we have in place. Uh, I just wanted to see if anyone else has any questions um, regarding this particular agenda item, item 1B. Council member Snell. I have no further questions. I was able to go over these things and um, have a conversation when I met with the city manager in advance. So I was able to resolve my, my questions at that time. Thank you. Um, Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza. Um, so my only question is, it looks like Chris Williams and his lawyer, Corey Briggs, uh, at least the city had to spend $7,500 on various lawsuits brought by them, some of which we won. I thank you so very much, and I do not have any comments at this time. Do we have a motion? I move approval of the payment you made. Second. We have a motion and a second. I'll ask our city clerk to call the roll. The motion was made by Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza with a second by Council Member Snow. Roll call vote. Council Member Snow? Aye. Council Member LeBaron? Council Member LeBaron, it does no good to not talk about how the public's money is spent in front of them in public, so that's why I always have these pools. I don't ask these questions behind closed doors like my council members do, uh, like how Allison Snow says she does. I like to have these conversations in front of the taxpayers, and my vote is no. Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza? Aye. Mayor Vasquez? Aye. The motion passes on a vote of 3-1-1. I thank you. Next is item 1B, which is a resolution ratifying an emergency declaration and ratifying the emergency repair of a storm drain at 6971 Broadway. And I'll turn it over to Council Member LeBaron. You have two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the purpose of pulling things from the consent calendar is that versus all of us not talking about these topics in front of the public and the public not having the opportunity to hear us talk about these things, the purpose of pulling them out is not just so that I can ask a couple questions, it, it is also so that staff, which is here and is always prepared, can tell us a little bit more about this so that the public can benefit from that information. So Izzy, can you just tell us a little bit about this storm drain? Why is this, why is this being put on Uh, before you start, I just need for Council Member LeBaron to clarify her question. I don't have questions at this time. I want staff to tell the public a little bit more about what this is. This has to do with storm drains, and he was just going to get to it. After he discusses a little bit about this, he doesn't need to go into this for a whole hour, but after he goes into this, I will have questions. So um, this is specifically for you to ask your two questions. And um, if you read the agenda item, you will see the entire background is there for you to read. <laughs> but not just you, the entire public. And so um, as elected officials, it is our obligation to her due diligence, read the information, and then if we have questions beyond what has been provided to us for clarification, that's the time to ask questions. I think that it's important to know that, um, you know, the public instills trust in us to follow through. And so if you have two questions regarding this particular item, please ask your two questions. Otherwise, I will check in with the other three council members and then I'll uh, seek a, a vote. Madam Mayor, my question for you is, do you have an issue with city staff talking about public matters in front of the public? Because nowhere in this manual of policies and procedures that we adopted, nowhere in here does it say that a council member has to only ask two questions. What it does say is that a council member can do exactly what I did, which was yesterday I sent an email to all 
to the city staff asking that this agenda item be plucked from the consent calendar so that it could be discussed in front of the public. So that is what's going to be done right here, unless you want to break your own policies and procedures and not allow city staff to talk about something that I have followed the rules on, have asked this be taken off of the consent calendar, and he is willing and able, more than willing and able, to give us a little synopsis of what this is all about. Do you have an issue with topics that pertain to the public being discussed in front of them? Because there's a little room full of people right here. I'm sure they probably want to hear about storm drains. Um, what I will do to assist you is I will actually read the background information into the record so that you can understand exactly what um, item 1D is all about. And so I'm reading the agenda item for you. And the intent of this agenda item is to seek city council's ratification of the city manager's in her role as director of emergency service, approval of repairs of a failed section of a 72 inch storm drain. During the January 22nd, 2024 winter storm, a large sinkhole formed in the alley behind the Subway restaurant located at 6971 Broadway. The sinkhole was caused by a failed section of the regional storm drain pipe that runs behind the business. Due to the increased size of the sinkhole and proximity to structures, it was determined that additional damage could be catastrophic for the subject properties and presented a threat to the health and safety of the community, creating an urgent need to repair the damage and secure the subject property immediately. On January 25, 2024, MJC Construction was contracted to assess the pipe for further damage and perform the necessary repairs. And so now everyone has the background on this particular agenda item. You may now ask your two questions. Thank you, Madam Mayor. You're quite condescending and very, very rude. <laughs> Anywho, so now that the mayor has very elementary style read us what our paid and professional staff could have, and in more depth, because this is actually his expert of his area of expertise, <coughs> unlike it is for you, Rep. Vasquez, I'm going to ask. So it says the sinkhole was caused by failed storm drain and it is being asked if it be fixed because of its proximity to structures. It's a threat to safety and the health of the community. Just uh, an hour or so ago, we heard residents say that there is failed storm drains that are in proximity to structures, AKA their homes. There is a threat to their safety and their health, which is definitely a threat to the safety and health of the community, um, and they're asking that we look into that matter on how the city might possibly help repair what they perceive to be public infrastructure. My question is, all these things standing, and if they're the same in other cases, what is making us choose to fix this, or city staff, sorry, choose to fix this versus these folks who are sitting right here? Mr. Maria, you may answer this question. This particular case is a public storm drain uh, resulting from a publicly accepted easement. So it's a city storm drain. Okay, so that, that's making it clear that the, the city is taking the position that storm drains that lead from a street, a public street, are, are, not, are not public and that we have, these folks have to pay for that individually. Okay, thank you. That's it, that's all my only questions. Uh, thank you so very much. I'll check to see if any of the other council members have questions. Uh, you have two maximum. I'll uh, turn it over to council member Allison Snow. Um, I'll just hold and uh, write on the stand. Um, Mayor Bostown Mendoza. Uh, thank you. And so for this particular agenda item, um, I will lean to council members know to make a motion. Um, I, I move to go ahead and offer it. 
to approve a resolution ratifying an emergency declaration and ratifying the emergency <coughs> repair of a storm drain at 6971 Broadway. And do we have a second? I'll second. Yeah. We have a motion and a second. I'll um, turn it over to our department to call the roll. Yes, the motion was made by Council Member Snow with a second by Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza. This action tonight requires a four fifth vote. I'll go ahead and conduct the roll call. Council Member LeBaron. Council Member LeBaron, I'm all for the city taking care of its business and fixing things that are their responsibility to fix. And I'm glad that this is an easement that the city has explicitly accepted. And yes, I think that we should fix it if it's broken. So that is a yes. Council Member Snow? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza? Aye. Mayor Vasquez? Aye. The motion passes on a vote of 4 0 1. Thank you. Item 1E is to adopt a resolution authorizing emergency repairs at 7701 Nicholas Street. <coughs> and so, uh, Council Member LeBaron, since you asked uh, that this item be pulled, can you please ask your two questions? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, my question is that Izzy, please explain a little bit more about this. How has how has this all come about? I understand that this is to repair damage done at the Lemon Grove Little League fields. If you can elaborate, give us some more wisdom. I mean, you're the expert, so. Um, Mr. Mardia, if you could give a very brief uh, summary regarding this particular agenda item. We all have the agenda, we have the background, and so I'll make it very, very brief. Thank you. So Council Mayor LeBaron, members of the City Council Mayor, uh, so this particular storm drain is a 30-inch uh, corrugated metal pipe storm drain that runs between Nickel Street and Ensenada Street. It discharges into the Bakersfield Channel. It's approximately 500 feet. Uh, with the storm uh, on January 22nd, um, that uh, that storm uh, further enhanced or undermined the uh, CMP CMP pipe. Uh, staff has been aware that uh, the pipe itself was already in bad shape, um, <clears throat> creating sinkholes at the perimeter of the baseball fields. Um, with the storm uh, that occurred. Uh, those sinkholes have uh, encroached into the outfield, uh, so they're in the midst of the baseball field, whereas previous to the storm, they were outside the, uh, out, the outside, uh, outside the fence line of, of the outfield. Uh, additionally, uh, additional uh, sinkholes formed in the parking lot and uh, within the alignment of the, of the CMP pipe, uh, traversing north through to the Baker Street. Thank you, Izzy. Question, is that pipe that runs through there, right, the Lemon Grove Little League? Actually, let me say this. So my understanding is that not everything that happens at the Lemon Grove Little League is the responsibility of the city to fix, because I've heard city staff say that that's not our property, like that's not city property, so the city doesn't have to spend funds on certain things for the Little League. I know that the city has been asked to repair roofs, like the little dugout roofs or uh, concession stand roof, and the city has said, no, we're not gonna fix that roof because that's not our problem. So question is, is that pipe that runs through the Little League, is that the city's, is that something the city accepts as public infrastructure? Yes, the, the, the storm drain pipe is a, uh, within a publicly accepted easement. That, that is a publicly accepted easement, and it's like written in all this. It, it, yes, would be in, in, the, in the subdivision map, your question, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. And, um, and I'll yeah. go ahead and check with our city council members to see if anyone else has questions. Remember, you have two questions for this agenda item. 
for agenda item 1e um, do you have an estimated cost on what the emergency repairs might come to Cost estimate is uh, 500,000 um, that does not include full restoration of um, some of the outflow perimeter areas and some of those areas we believe are due to not storm drain, but other irrigation drainage uh, that might have caused uh, erosion on certain uh, areas of the outfield. But uh, <coughs> repair the alignment of the pipe, uh, restore uh, the slope where the pipe discharges, um, installing a new manhole, would run about 500,000. All right, thank you. Do you know where that 500,000 is going to come from? Yeah, so. Uh, it comes from emergency. It'll come from emergency reserves. And that's the reason why we have emergency reserves. Um, and then, um, again, both of the projects that the council has discussed will be um, submitted to FEMA if they open up the um, public assistance for government agencies. So we would ask for reimbursement back on those. Um, and whatever portion that's related to this one. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza. <coughs> no questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And I do not have any questions at this time. Do we have a motion for this particular agenda item? I make a motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. I ask our city clerk to call the roll. The motion was made by the motion was made by Council Member LeBaron with a second by Council Member Snow. To approve staff, staff's recommendation. This item tonight requires a fourth its vote. Uh, Council Member LeBaron? Council Member LeBaron? Aye. Council Member Snow? Aye. Mayor Cortez Mendoza? Uh, before I vote, um, Council Member LeBaron, you can uh, state your motion. Council Member LeBaron, I would like to adopt a resolution authorizing emergency repairs at 7701 Nichols Street. Thank you. And my vote is aye. Thank you. So the motion on the floor is to approve staff's recommendation. Uh, the motion was made by Council Member LeBaron with a second by Council Member Snow. And then I have Council Member LeBaron's vote as a yes. Council Member Snow? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Mendoza? Aye. Mayor Vasquez? Aye. The motion passes on a vote of four ayes, zero noes, and one absent. Uh, thank you. Moving on to the Council Member Meeting Report. This section of the meeting is dedicated to oral reports from the City Council members about meetings attended at the expense of the city. A report should be a brief summary of meetings attended in your capacity as a city official, specifically the boards and commissions that you are uh, assigned to. As a reminder, we want to be careful to keep these comments brief and to stay within the boundaries of the Brown Act. This includes matters that are not on the agenda. I will start with council members. No. On February 8th, I attended the San Diego Chamber of Commerce's 153rd anniversary celebration. I also attended the East County Subregion Sandag Board Briefing. On February 12th, I met with the Mexican Consulate regarding flood, re flood resources for people impacted in our community.